Another important visual element is color. It is essential to the visual arts. The science of color optics is fairly advanced physics, and fortunately, you need to know only the most basic optical principles to appreciate color as one of the formal elements. Color is a function of light. Without light, there can be no color. Color is visible in refracted light. When a prism breaks a light beam into a spectrum of color or in a rainbow after a storm. Color is also visible in reflected light when objects around us absorb some of the spectrum and bounce back the rest. Those rays that are reflected to our eyes are the color or hue of the object. The visible spectrum consists of the colors red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. As already discussed, the value of a color, like the value of any light, is its degree of lightness or darkness. If we wrap the colors of the spectrum around into a circle, we create a color wheel. On the color wheel, instead of being at opposite extremes, red and violet lie next to each other. On this color wheel before you, the primary colors have been numbered 1, the secondary colors a 2, and the tertiary colors a 3. Tertiary colors are mixtures of adjoining primary and secondary colors. On a traditional color wheel, the primary colors are red, yellow, and blue. Primary colors cannot be mixed from other colors and produce all other colors. Each of the primary colors has what's called a complementary color, which is made by mixing the other two primaries. Thus, the complementary hue of red is green, violet is the complementary of yellow, and orange is the complementary of blue. Complementary colors are colors that are found directly across from each other on the color wheel. Whereas colors that lie next to each other on the color wheel are called analogous. They form families of color such as yellow and orange, orange and red, and green and blue. A complementary or an analogous pairing does not have to be exact. An artist may match one color to another that is not exactly its opposite or directly adjacent on the color wheel. The saturation of a color is its pureness. In their purest, most brilliant state, colors are at a maximum saturation. As they become more and more neutral, they are said to be lower in saturation. The degree to which colors are mixed with other colors, or black, gray, or white, reduces the purity of the color, and so the intensity or brightness of the color is reduced. Artists produce shades of a given hue by adding black, and tints by adding white. Color has psychological dimensions. Analogous colors appear harmonious, whereas complementary colors will appear jarring and popping, and discordant. The warm hues of red, orange, and yellow seem to come forward in relation to other hues and actually stimulate the sensation of warmth by association with fire and sun. Cool colors blues, greens, and violets, appear to recede from the viewer and have a cooling effect, probably from associations with shade, water, and greenery. Although the enjoyment of color may be universal, color remains a very emotional and subjective element. However, responses to color are not just biological, they are also influenced by color associations from our culture. Color affects us intuitively, not only can color have the sensation of warmth and coolness associated with them, but color in works of art can also trigger strong emotional responses in the viewer, working hand in hand with line and shape. The colors on the green-blue side of the wheel are considered cool, whereas the colors on the yellow-orange-red side are considered warm. Rooms decorated in green or blue make us feel cooler on a hot day in comparison to a red or orange room. The legendary Notre Dame football coach, Newt Rockney, attempted to use awareness of the psychological effects of color competitively. To stir up his own players, he painted their locker room red. 
He had the visiting team's locker room painted in blue-greens in efforts to sedate them both before the game and when they returned to relax at halftime. Similarly, the influence of environmental colour was demonstrated in one factory where workers were complaining about feeling cold. Rather than raise the thermostat, management decided to paint the blue-green walls coral. The complaint stopped. It's also interesting to note that intensive care units are never painted red, not just because of our association with colour red, blood and anger, but because rooms painted red have been found to raise our pulse. Colour can also symbolise love, passion, martyrdom, danger or revolution. Like the concept of beauty, the symbols of colours, their meanings, are culture specific. We may associate white with a bride in American culture, but in China, brides wear red. Colour is considered one of the most useful and powerful design tools we have. People respond to different colours in different ways, and these responses take place on a subconscious emotional level. In our American culture, black has long been associated with death, while white is believed to signify life and purity. In certain parts of Asia, however, white is the traditional color of mourning. In the United States, black has come to also suggest sophistication and formality. Americans generally associate trust and stability with the color blue, while Koreans have this reaction to pink and other pastel colors. We all link mood with color. We say someone is green with envy, red with anger, blue with sorrow, and white with fright. Feelings and behavior are symbolized with color, not just in our everyday language, but also in our arts. Texture Our sixth visual element Like any other visual element, texture can contribute to our understanding and interpretation of an artwork. Texture can evoke a strong emotional response. Texture refers to the real or apparent quality of the surface. It's the visual or tactile surface characteristic of an object, whether rough, smooth, or somewhere in between. Tactile texture, actual texture, consists of physical surface variations that can be perceived by the sense of touch. Texture adds a significant dimension to art. For example, anyone touching Leon Kossoff's portrait of father number two would feel the thickly applied paint. A term used for such thickly applied paint is impasto. Kossoff uses the application impasto to tell us also of his relationship with his father, as it implies an overall aggressive, confrontational feeling. His choice of colors reveals something too. His father appears gloomy, stern and severe. When we contrast Kossoff's work with Maria Lorenzine's Mother and Child, we perceive an entirely different feeling. Lorenzine's painting is done in muted, soft colours, which produce a sense of harmony, tranquillity and peace. Reinforcing these feelings is the texture, which is soft and smooth, and so produce together a feeling of intimacy between the mother and child. Visual texture is a simulated texture, the appearance of texture such as flower petals in a still life as seen in Rekha Roysch's Flower Still Life. Here she creates the illusion of various textures with painstaking detail of tulips, carnations and roses. Yet the surface, if one were to touch it, is flat and smooth. Texture can also be merely implied through a purely visual illusion called trompe l'oeil. When an artist makes an exact likeness of something, in a realistic way, the result is trompe l'oeil, a French term for fool the eye. A great example of trompe l'oeil is seen in David Gilhooly's Bowl of Chocolate Mousse. If we were to touch Gilhooly's visual pun, Bowl of Chocolate Mousse, we would find it cold and hard, as it is made of ceramic, yet visually it looks like yummy creamy chocolate. Likewise, viewers are often fascinated by the ability of pop artist James Rosenquist to capture believable reality in his painting Gift-Wrapped Doll No. 19. 
Rosenquist not only captures the likeness of a wide-eyed porcelain doll wrapped in cellophane, exactly, but he also fools the eye into believing that the painted material has the same surface texture as it does in nature. To fool the eye, the artist observes how the surface cellophane reflects light. Light reflections, more than anything else, gives the eye clues about the texture of a surface. Although the result is only an illusion, Rosenquist recreates the texture of a thin transparent sheet of cellophane with great observations of how light reflects from this material. It is so real-like that we feel if we were to touch it, we could hear the sound of crinkling, crackling cellophane. When we look beyond the wrapping and examine the doll herself, we are faced with a haunting and somewhat sinister image. The doll is synodic. Her pouty lips are turning blue, as if she can't breathe beneath the cellophane. Our textbook suggests that this is perhaps a commentary on the ways in which the Western ideal of beauty blue eyes, blonde hair, and a cupid's bow mouth can suffocate the little girls who grow into women.